We did this in Boston about a week and a half ago, um, especially the section at the beginning where you want to see features and roadmaps and stuff. Um, if you want to take a look at that, um, these slides will all get posted, but if you just search for um, Red Hat OpenShift 4 release update uh, on YouTube, the videos out there, um, Mike Barrett, who runs product management, uh, and Clayton and Derek, who run engineering or kind of core to engineering, go through a lot of things. So um, if you didn't feel like you got enough this week or you don't get a chance to go by the booth, um, check out that video as well. So I'll wrap this up, and I'll kind of keep this part sort of short. We started doing these events about three and a half years ago at one of the very first Cube Cons. It was really, really, at the time, about the technology, kind of about the clouds. Um, you know, is, how does Kubernetes work? What are the basics? Um, today, I think you found that it was much more about kind of what people are actually doing with it, use cases. So first and foremost, thank you for coming. Um, this event continues to grow. It's grown quite a bit over the last couple of years. I got to grab some numbers for what today looked like. But um, it's been fantastic to see as many people be interested in OpenShift as we see the rest of the growing uh, Kubernetes. So thank you all for sticking around, for staying for eight hours. I know this is a lot to take in. Um, if you didn't get anything, if you don't get your question answered, please come by the booth. We'll be here all week, um, so please come by the booth as well. Um, I think nowadays what we tend to talk about more and more, and this may sometimes overtake some of the technical conversation, is it's much more about what people are doing. So if you get a chance, take advantage of that all day. I know Diane's been talking about meet your peers. Um, if you're seeing people from your industry doing interesting things, not from your industry doing interesting things, um, this has turned out to be a really, really good networking event as much as it's a, a, a technical event. What, what can we learn from it? Um, the other thing I kind of highlight all the time is over the last three years, these are, I think most of them, I hope I didn't leave anybody out, the companies who have been uh, brave enough to come up and tell their story. And I highlight this not because it's a lot of uh, logos, which is always great, but because these are the companies that um, if you look at this and you say, they're in my industry, uh, they're a competitor to me, these folks are all somewhere between a year to two years along in their journey. And we've had people who say, you know, we're not sure if we're ready to make a, a cloud journey or do digital transformation or DevOps or whatever that change thing is. Uh, there are a lot of companies who not only are out there telling their story, um, they're hiring, uh, but they're sort of setting the agenda for their industry. So something to kind of keep in mind in terms of um, what's, what's kind of happening in production out there. So this is called Road Ahead. Um, I get the question all the time, hey, you do strategy, what does the Road Ahead look like? Um, in some cases, it is people that want to move brownfield things. So we've had uh, you know, banks tell us they're going to move core banking into containers onto this. We've seen people lift and shift stuff. Uh, Volvo runs all of their WebSphere, IBM WebSphere stuff on this. Um, that seems like kind of an unusual uh, on the surface thing, but it allowed them to very quickly move to leveraging public cloud as well. So we do see a certain amount of brownfield get moved over to containers. We also see a certain amount of greenfield with a whole bunch of restrictions. So we want to do 12-factor applications, but we also then have to do other stuff. So part of it is going to be sort of greenfields with certain kind of hard restrictions about what's going on. And then we also see some greenfield stuff where the future isn't completely understood. So you may have heard today about Knative or about Istio or some of the early stuff in operators, and you go, that sounds really cool, but what's the roadmap for two years? And in some cases, this stuff will have a roadmap for two years, but it's only nine months old. So we see kind of a broad mix of all of those things. Uh, we try and showcase that to you through a lot of the customer example stories that um, people are doing it, in some cases, with AI and ML. In other cases, it's mobile. Um, the nice thing is Kubernetes is really good at dealing with a lot of different use cases. I throw this up there just as a, you know, why have I been sitting here for eight hours thing. Uh, we had a very large customer, large energy customer, who spoke last week at Red Hat Summit, but it told us this a couple of weeks ago. They said, I came to your event two years ago. We didn't really know anything about OpenShift. We didn't really know a whole lot about Kubernetes. Um, we just sat and took notes. And then we kind of walked around and listened and told stories. Um, they got up on stage two weeks ago and talked about having 100 different development groups around the world out finding new energy sources. Um, this is a Fortune, I don't know, five company. Um, but these events are really good for finding people that are doing things that you may not be sure that you're, you're capable of doing. Um, and then a couple of years later, 18 months later, 12 months later, we're seeing some pretty interesting results. So hopefully, as you're sitting there and your butt's sort of sore, um, the results of these things will kind of come back as you go back and take your notes. So onto the technology stuff. So 
I tend to, to look at this as, I think we're moving into about the third era of Kubernetes, uh, which sounds crazy because there's really only been about six or seven or eight KubeCons. It's only been around for about five years. But we've seen these very distinct leaps. The first sort of big thing was it went from a Google project to it had to be a well-governed open source project to getting some of the enterprises going, hey, that stuff sounds like a problem that I have, right? Um, I'll give an example. We had a bank who was telling us the story. They moved from sort of web banking to mobile banking. And as far as consumer banking goes, there's really only one day that matters, and that's Friday when we all get paid. And what they found was when it used to be on web banking, people would, on average, log in about one time a day because they'd log in from their office and they weren't really sure if people were looking. When it moved to mobile, mobile banking and it became their own personal device, people were logging in eight to 10 times a day because they really wanted to make sure they were getting paid. So for one day a week, 20% of the time, you have an 8x spike in what you do, and people started going, that sounds like a web scale problem. Google's going to give me the free software to do that. Cool. The next generation became, well, I want to do more stuff on that. And we started seeing stateful sets, and we started seeing batch jobs, and we started seeing uh, stateless, and we started seeing other types of use cases, which is kind of what you've seen from customers today. And then what we're moving into is really this third generation where it's um, how do I automate those things much more? How do we make the platform simpler to run? How do I run them across all sorts of different clouds? We've been talking about hybrid cloud and multi-cloud for four or five plus years. We're starting to see the rest of the industry go, yeah, that's a real thing, even though maybe I run one public cloud. So I think we're really going to start to see this third generation be dominant in what's going on with KubeCon today, but we will see it become things that are mainstream platform and product technologies over the next year or two. Um, <clears throat> We built OpenShift 4 around about four or five years of feedback, feedback from all of you. And the one big feedback that we got more than anything else was, yes, Kubernetes is interesting, and yes, containers are interesting, and all those other things, blah, blah, blah. But what, they ultimately, what you ultimately told us was, we are going to run things on-prem in some cases. We're going to run things in the public cloud in some cases. But we want you to design the platform around is the ease of use, the simplicity, the things that we've come to expect from the public cloud experience. So while there were folks who were talked about being in banking and being in you know, totally disconnected environments, they say, I want that simplicity. I want things to just run. I want them to run as a service. And so the big things that come out of OpenShift 4 that you'll see in 4.1 and then going forward is all about that, right? We want operations to be really simple. How many people were really used to doing three-month upgrades for anything in infrastructure, right? I tell people all the time, if you were a VMware admin, you did zero upgrades every three months. You did them every 12 to 18 months. If you were a Cisco admin, it was every 12 to 18 months. And then these crazy Kubernetes people come along and go, yeah, every three months, just CIC day, that sucker, YOLO, baby, infrastructure. And people are like, you're out of your mind, dude. I run a bank. I run the federal government. I run military. I run defense. That stuff can't go down. No, 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 every three months. We had to figure out how to find that right balance, right? We had to make sure that there was interoperability and standards. Everybody comes to us and says, yes, I like this, but in the future we want to know that we could use something else. Cool, right? We want to know there's lots of stuff on demand. I don't want to just do databases. I want to do databases as a service. I want to do queuing as a service. I want to do Kafka as a service. We had to make sure those were all there. Obviously, we talked about security. It is kind of funny to me that like 10, 15 years ago, everybody's parents were like, don't talk to strangers. And then us internet nerds were like, don't put your credit card on the internet. And now we just get on a phone and we, get, we call strangers off the internet to come pick us up in a car and we just jump in their car. So, you know, security's always sort of uh, what it is. <clears throat> and then finally, we wanted to make sure there's broad application support. Um, Rob talked about this, about operators. And you're going to hear about operators. I think he's got a keynote at some point this week talking about operators. Operators are very cool in the context of saying, I want things as a service. We want database as a service. That's sort of the canonical example. Um, this is a kind of a good slide to help you go. What's the difference between I deployed something, this is what the cloud-like experience looks like, and this is what we could actually deliver as a service, right? <clears throat> so that's kind of cool. And then I got to thinking about it, and I'm like, OK, all these folks are going to go home. And they're going to go, hey, uh, you know, boss, team, they said we should do operators. And somebody's going to go, yeah, but what does it buy us? So I kind of did a little bit of math. And this isn't totally right. It's not totally great, but it's a little bit. <clears throat> so I went out and I looked at like RDS, right? Kind of the canonical web or uh, cloud thing. Cost you about $16,000 a year for a decent size one. So the one that costs about a buck 90 per. And then Amazon came along and said, you know, there's a lot of extra stuff that people always want. 
with their database as a service. They'd like it backed up. They'd like it highly available. They'd like it to sort of scale on demand and other stuff. So let's call that sort of the advanced RDS, right? They call it Aurora. The premium for Aurora is about $3,500 a year per database. And this isn't intended to be any sort of commentary on pricing for Amazon databases. But when you're talking to people about saying, like, why would we think about doing databases, essentially, for $3,500 a year, you get, well, the clouds charge you $3,500 a year to now do what we're essentially doing in operators included with the platform. And oh, by the way, this will be for the same operations in every single cloud environment. So that same operator that you want to run on OpenShift in your, data, in your cloud, on-prem, on Azure, on AWS, on anywhere, exactly the same. And the other thing is, all of those databases that you typically get in the cloud are going to be open source only. As you saw from the list that <clears throat> Rob showed and some other people showed, this is going to be both the open source ones as well as the commercial ones. So if you're like, hey, we want SQL, but we want Microsoft SQL, or we want Kafka, but we want Confluent Kafka, you can kind of go either path, right? So um, these slides will get published and so forth. These are just some of the ones that are out there. But kind of wanted to give you some numbers to talk about, yes, what does all this stuff mean? What does it mean in terms of dollars and cents? It's 3,500 bucks, 4,000 bucks, whatever your sort of thing is, but that just becomes an embedded feature. Now multiply that by however many databases you run, however many Kafka queues you run, and so forth. So the other thing that comes up all the time and people ask us, so we had a bunch of questions about what's roadmap and what's things. There's an interesting thing that happens at this event that doesn't necessarily happen like at Red Hat Summit. So this week you will hear a whole bunch of new stuff get uh, talked about. Something new will come out, it'll have a crazy weird name, and it will be 0.0.01. .0 and then everybody will go, dude, are you running that? Are you running that? Are you running the thing yet? Right? And you'll be like, man, I'm not running the thing. Shit. Uh, let's put some things in perspective. So Prometheus, which is very, very cool, took 18 months to get from version 1 to version 2. Right? Istio, which, you know, still evolving, still pretty cool took 15 months to get from alpha to 1.0, right? Lots of people working on that. Knative has now taken nine months to get four sub-releases to not even sort of even GA, right? So as you're thinking about the cool stuff that comes out this week, it's always neat to have that squirrel moment, but it's taken the community a while to get there. So as you're thinking like, well, when am I gonna get this and when does it sort of become production or when is it gonna be ready for me? Cool thing is it's open source, you can go play with it right now. But the other thing is, is you're setting expectations, set them appropriately for when this thing will get to the point where your business will run it in production or run it in something that you want to go move into something that you don't want to support every single day, okay? Um, the other thing I throw out all the time is there's always this perspective in the Kubernetes community that we're always on the latest and greatest, right? So let's see, it's, it's May, so next month 1.15 will likely come out or July 1.15 will come out. And I always ask this question, how many of you are running 114 today? One guy in the back. He should get a trophy, uh, too. Okay. Um, give, him a, give him a thing. <laughs> you have to take him home because Diane doesn't want to take the box home either, so you're definitely getting an award. But here's the thing. How many of you know that most of the major cloud providers aren't running more than 112 at the latest? Amazon's running 112 now. Google, Google actually skipped 112 because they it had some struggles with it, and they're still on 111. Uh, we're on one third. We're going to be on one thirteen. Essentially, and we sort of track this just so we know how well we're doing or not well doing. Most everybody in the industry who makes this into something that becomes a product takes a little while to stabilize the thing. And I don't show this to sort of highlight one vendor versus the other. I also sort of show this for those of you that go, no, 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 forget all that. We're doing it on our own. Okay, this is sort of the baseline for people that have world class sets of teams. If you're rolling it faster than this, you're awesome. Make sure you get a whole bunch of the badges out there. But if you're trying to figure out like how reasonably would we take to get the newest stuff, it's not unusual to take four months or five months or six months. Because remember we said, all that other stuff that you were used to rolling out every 18 months or something, we're now asking you to roll out every three, four, five, six months, okay? And all this stuff is public data. You kind of have to scrub through to people's websites, but um, it's all out there. So trying to set some expectations as far as what it means to get from upstream stuff, cool, shiny stuff at an event like this, to something that you're going to use for whatever you do to actually make money, okay? So with that, in terms of where this stuff's going, so we tried to make the platform way better. One of the things that you'll see at this event is the focus of the event is still called KubeCon, but it's also CloudNativeCon. 
and we're seeing more and more of the things as, as Kubernetes becomes much more stabilized. We're trying to keep that core very small. Um, we see some extensions to the APIs and so forth, but we're trying to avoid Kubernetes becoming that big tent. And we're seeing more and more of the projects that are interesting. All those ones I showed you are sort of outside of Kubernetes. Right? Prometheus isn't part of Kubernetes, but it's great at monitoring Kubernetes. Knative isn't part of Kubernetes, but it's great at delivering function level applications on top of containers and Kubernetes. So as you're looking at this week and you're starting to look at keynotes and you're looking at projects and you're like, how come they're all not just Kubernetes whatever? It's because uh, the design of what's going on is moving kind of around it and it's allowing the projects to be somewhat independent. Obviously they work together with the core, um, but they're, they're somewhat independent. They're allowing that speed and flexibility and timing um, to sort of work itself out, okay? So a couple of last things before you go. Um, as far as learning, if you are a hands-on learner, uh, I highly recommend learn.openshift.com. So totally free, you log in with the browser. Um, it's, it's not scripted, but it's essentially like courseware where you're doing hands-on stuff, right? We work with a company called Katakota that does these simulations for us. So really good stuff if you wanna play around with basics of OpenShift, you wanna play with new stuff, you wanna play with Istio, you wanna play with Knative, um, great for hands-on. If you're kind of a visual kind of learner, um, Diane runs a great set of events typically every week, probably not this week, but typically every week with somebody from the community. Sometimes it's engineering, sometimes it's our technology partners. Uh, these are all out on YouTube, so if you go and look up OpenShift Commons briefings. Uh, if you're an audio sort of learner, I run a podcast called PodCTL that typically is about once every week, sometimes it's late. Um, and it's a mix of Kubernetes stuff and OpenShift stuff. Um, if you want to go play with it, go to try.openshift.com, if we haven't mentioned that yet this week. And then if you're a reader, or you want to annoy your spouse on a, on a vacation or something, um, all of these books are generally free. You can get them either from O'Reilly or Manning. Um, really good set for developer interaction, operations interaction, a um, bunch of folks who, who live and breathe this stuff every day. And then finally, if you haven't heard from Diane already, um, and by the way, give her a huge round of applause. These are really hard events to put on. Um, if you get a chance um, and you want more of this or you want more chances to interact with stuff, uh, we ask for one basic thing. We ask you to sign up. So if you go to commons.openshift.com and right there, kind of at the top, you can do it. There's a bunch of cool stuff. The cool stuff being you're going to learn things. You're going to learn from other smart people. You have access to being on Diane's mailing list for learning about the weekly things that are going on. Um, it's free. Uh, go do it now. It's still free if you haven't done it yet. Uh, it's real simple. Who are you? And if you can sign up with your company, that's great as well. Uh, but we highly recommend that. So thank you all for being here all day. Um, this has been great for us to get your feedback. We will be around some if you want to ask questions. And if you don't get us because you're going to go have a beer, go have dinner, please come by the booth and come talk to us. So thank you very much.